request for apologies. There are all present and correct. Excellent. Uh, declarations of conflict of interest, are there any? None? Right. Um, well, quickly welcome Andrew. Thank you for beaming in, Andrew. Um, I've actually, how many times have I seen you in this? This is about the third or fourth time I think I've seen you in this um, capacity in terms of some of the audit risk committees and some of the councils. So Andrew, we'll pass it over to you. Now, have you, has everyone got a copy of Andrew's presentation in front of them? Um, or are you going to, yep. Are you going to share your screen as well or are you just happy I'll to? Share the screen. I think we'll share the screen. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Over to you. Welcome, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. It's uh, something we do like to do is get out and uh, visit all our uh, member councils. Um, in your area, Fokatane, Apotiki, Rotorua are all members. So it's an area we do visit on a regular basis. So hopefully in the future, uh, we can catch up in uh, person. Yes, certainly, Philip, we've seen you with Kaikoura and South Wairapa quite recently. Um, so you're a bit of an expert in this. Um, I'm happy to tell you about LGFA and what our council members are doing, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that we're not independent advisors. So anything along, along the lines of what you should or shouldn't be doing are probably questions you should address to Philip. Uh, after I've uh, gone. Right, I'll try and share the screen. I'll try and perhaps keep this to sort of 10 minutes and then, you know, leave it to you to sort of ask uh, questions is probably where we can get the most benefit. Right. Okay, hopefully that's working. Oops. Okay, so page two of the presentation, um, LGFA is a very well established model. Uh, LGFA was set up or started in 2012 in New Zealand, so it's been going for uh, just over eight years uh, now. But it was originally modelled on the four Scandinavian countries. The, which have a very similar sort of model in terms of the uh, cross-guarantee type nature and very much cooperative uh, style of sort of operating. But the oldest of those is in Denmark, uh, which has been going for over 120 years uh, now. Um, none of those four Scandinavian countries have ever had a council sort of defaulting on its debt. So, uh, the working together model to uh, ensure the sector uh, as a whole gets uh, better outcomes is something that is uh, very well proven and tested. Um, in recent years, we've had other countries that have set up uh, similar type models. So um, France is one, the UK is one, there's uh, one in Japan, uh, Canada, and in Australia, Victoria, the state of Victoria has um, a model which is not the same, but it has some of the, the same sort of uh, characteristics. Uh, currently, LGFA has uh, 67 uh, council members. So in the last sort of year or two, we've even had councils that have no debt or or minimal debt joining. And the benefit even for those is they sort of realise that um, even if they don't need to borrow the, once you've sort of gone through the process of joining and paid their legal costs, there's no ongoing costs for belonging. So just having the flexibility to borrow if your circumstances change um, is something that's sort of quite valuable. And even for councils that have a lot of financial assets, it's often going to be cheaper to get some short-term financing, perhaps for six months or a year, than it is to sell down some of your financial assets, particularly if you own uh, shares. Oops, put it wrong way. Um, uh, page uh, four of the presentation. So LGFA is rated by both Standard and Poor's and Fitch. 
the credit rating LGFA has from both those entities is AA plus. So that is the same rating as the New Zealand uh, government. So while LGFA is not guaranteed, or any of the councils are not guaranteed by the uh, government, the rating agencies view the strength of the sector and also the closeness of the relationship uh, with government as strongly supporting factors, and that enables us to get uh, that AA plus rating. So the best bank in New Zealand is rated AA minus, so that's uh, two notches below LGFA. And so that is the reason why, because LGFA has a better credit rating than the banks, that we can actually raise debt cheaper than what any bank can do in New Zealand. Um, and also because we're not trying to maximise our profit, that's not the aim of the LGFA. The aim is to get cheaper borrowing costs uh, to councils. Um, so because we're not trying to maximise our profit, that means we can uh, the margins that we charge are a whole lot less than what a bank uh, would charge. And, and maybe I just the other factor is, um, again, while the sector is not government guaranteed, we did see in uh, April when financial markets were particularly stressed that the government did two things. Firstly, the Minister of Finance wrote a, wrote a letter saying that when LGFA's standby facility with the Crown matures next year, that they were going to uh, roll that over. So again, that was a, um, a really good show of support from the government for LGFA. So that's something investors took uh, comfort from. And the second thing was that the Reserve Bank are currently buying back a whole lot of government bonds. So they expanded their uh, buyback program to L LGFA. So LGFA is the only non-government entity that the Reserve Bank is also uh, prepared to uh, buy uh, its bonds. So the Reserve Bank announced that they would buy over the next year $3 billion worth of LGFA bonds. So again, that support uh, is something that gives the rating agencies, investors, a lot of comfort and probably should give um, councils like yourselves comfort that even in distress times that you know LGFA is going to be able to uh, finance the sector. Uh, skip through. Just on interest rates, um, interest rates are probably the least of uh, councils uh, problems um, but to give you some idea um, if you wanted to borrow for terms at less than one year, the current all-up cost to you would be less than 1%. So three months would probably be about 0.6 of a percent at the moment. Um, if you wanted to borrow to our longest date of maturity, which is 2033, so that's 13 years, the cost to you would be all-up, so um, including your margins, would be less than 2%. So again, um, it's a particularly good time for the sector in terms of being able to raise uh, debt in order to uh, fund infrastructure. So again, as you're probably aware with all the COVID issues, there's probably some greater challenges out there facing councils um, rather than uh, interest rate costs at the moment. And who holds our bonds? Well, it's a mixture of investors. Um, so the largest uh, holder are the banks, which is the red line uh, there. Um, banks hold it as part of their liquidity portfolio. So that's investment reserves they hold if they ever need to sort of uh, sell down some assets to raise additional cash. Um, institutional investors uh, in New Zealand. So they're all the KiwiSaver funds, uh, the New Zealand Superannuation Fund, ACC, people like that. Uh, they are holder of our uh, bonds. And the other large investor is overseas investors. So again, they're investors that want to invest in New Zealand dollars. A lot of them have traditionally hold government bonds, um, but they, again, like the credit quality of the sector. Um, but often those investors want to invest in large volumes. They might want to do 10 million or 50 million at a time. And they also want things that they're able to sell. So, you know, if you're speaking to some of these investors who are large Japanese insurance companies or uh, German insurance companies, um, they probably wouldn't know who someone like Rotor or District Council was. 
um, and they don't want to invest five million dollars at a time you know they want to do bigger things um, so that's why by collect collectively adding up all of the council's borrowing demands we're able to get the scale where you can bring in uh, that interest from offshore uh, investors um, so just to be clear we're not issuing an foreign currency, we're issuing in New Zealand dollars. So these are investors that want to have New Zealand dollar investments as part of their uh, portfolios. I won't skip, that's just a map of the country. So again, it's uh, in the North Island, the only, uh, South Waikato are about to join. So the only two councils we don't have are yourselves and Napier. So hopefully we'll have all of the North Island uh, shortly. Um, these are just lists of all our council uh, loans, so you can see um, who our, uh, borrow, how much we've lent to uh, each council. Um, the last slide I wanted to touch on is just the issue of the guarantee. Um, so the issue surrounding whether you become a guarantor or not is that if you are a non-guarantor, and I think we have uh, 13 councils who are non-guarantors, uh, we're indifferent whether you join as a non-guarantor or not, so that's entirely up to you. Um, the issues are if you're a non-guarantor, you cannot borrow more than uh, $20 million. Um, it also means uh, if you're a non-guarantor, you pay an extra 0.1 of a percent or 10 basis points more for your uh, debt. Um, again, that's probably not particularly, well, any savings are good, I guess. It's not um, too important in the context that interest rates are, are so low. Um, if you were a guarantor, um, what you're guaranteeing is the financial obligations of LGFA. You're not directly guaranteeing um, the debt of other councils. So if a council did default on LGFA, um, it would mean that we wouldn't be too concerned in the, the fact that we have security over rates. So we would use that power to uh, impose a special rate on the council to get that money back over the next 10 or 20 years. We have plenty of access to liquidity, including a billion dollar uh, standby facility from the Crown that we've never used. Um, so the fact that we don't get a loan repaid is, is not something that's going to cause LGFA any sort of uh, uh, particular uh, stress. Um, but in terms of if we did call under the guarantee, it is based, the on a council share of rates. So your share of the total rates of all the guaranteeing members would be 0.16%. So it means for every 100 million of new equity we had to call, uh, you would um, uh, be required to contribute around $160,000. Um, again, based on your current sort of financial projections, it's not likely that you would need to borrow more than $20 million in the next sort of few years. If you decide not to be a guarantor, um, you can decide to become a guarantor at some future stage. Um, it's just a matter of signing an additional legal document. So that process is, is quite simple. So um, that's the considerations uh, there. And I've just put on your sort of current sort of financial covenants. Um, you have significant sort of headroom uh, in which to sort of borrow. Um, so there's going to be no problems in terms of the LGFA proving your membership given your current strong uh, financial position. Um, I might just stop there and happy to take any questions. Um, thanks for that, Andrew. Look, I'm actually happy to have Welcome to, I'm sorry for my apologies, I forgot to welcome the other councillors. Welcome. Um, happy to have any questions from um, members of the committee, councillors, or even um, staff if need be. So happy to open up for questions. Dave, David? If you unmute you, Matt. Hang on. Uh, yep. 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 Um, my, my question uh, is, um, 
if we become members, uh, which uh, sounds attractive, and um, we seek to borrow, um, I take it it's entirely up to us how we apply the borrowing so that um, uh, LGFA don't sort of exercise any any sort of um, vetoes or um, audits of, um, of the purposes. Is, is that? That's correct. The only obligation is that you're required to comply with the four financial covenants, which you easily do at the moment. Um, other than that, LGFA does not set any conditions on what a council uh, uh, can and can't do. So again, you know what, you know, we might have our own personal views about, you know, the council's use of money, but that is really an issue between the council and the community, what it decides to uh, spend its uh, money on. Um, okay. But we do, we also, we do want to encourage best practice. So again, things like councils having an audit and risk committee is something that we are keen to see and would encourage, but we don't make it a condition of a council being a uh, LGFA member or being able to borrow. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Andrew, you, you glanced over the um, slides regarding shareholders. I don't think Cara wants to be a shareholder, but can you just talk about um, who the shareholders are and the implications of shareholders? And if um, a council wanted to be a shareholder, what's the, what's the process? Yep, so there's 30 councils that are shareholders. So when LGFA was uh, established at the end of 2011, it needed some initial equity to sort of get up and running. So councils contributed 20 million of equity and the government contributed 5 million of equity. Um, so we now have 30 uh, council shareholders. We do pay a nominal dividend on those uh, shares. Um, so at the moment, the dividend rate is, it's 2% of our, over our cost of funds. So I'd probably be getting a dividend of three, three and a half percent at the moment. Um, but if you think of Auckland, I think have two million paid up shares, so their dividend might be um, $30,000 or something. So being a shareholder or getting a dividend is not the motivating factor of why uh, councils are shareholders. It is the, the big benefits come on the savings that you get from your interest sort of costs. Um, so it's simply a matter of some councils that needed to put some money in. Um, we're not proposing to issue any new shares because we don't need additional equity. Um, you could potentially buy shares off another council if that's something you wanted to particularly doing. But I'd probably advise against it because again, the financial returns you get are small and all you get are the additional uh, compliance and voting and things that comes along with being a shareholder. So for example, you have to approve director remuneration. So again, it's just something that tends to tie up council time for very little financial benefit. You'll get exactly the same financial benefits in terms of um, interest savings uh, in a relative sense as to all the sh to what the shareholders are, are, are getting. Any other questions? Just through the just through the chair, um, yeah. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you for your detailed presentation. Um, and welcome from probably far away. Um, just a couple of queries on the standby facility that you mentioned, and you explained it later on that it was a billion dollars sitting with the crown. Is it something that has been accessed or is accessed on a maybe a non regular basis? And the second part of my question relates to the 13 years that you mentioned, sorry, the maximum term. Um, is that standard, 2033 at this stage, or is that something that's reviewed? Thank you. Yep, so addressing the last one first. So our longest state of bond that LGFA has issued to investors is April 2033. So councils can borrow to any date that you want up to that date. At some stage in the future, we're likely to issue a longer date of bond than that. So we'll probably do a 2037 bond in the next couple of years. 
Um, but you don't have to issue to the same maturities that we're issuing. You can just pick whatever date suits, suits you. In terms of the standby facility, that was something the Crown offered LGFA when it was first established to assist it getting uh, up and running. We've never had to access that since um, uh, we've been sort of established. Um, it got a bit, you know, uh, challenging in sort of March, April this uh, year. So for a period of time, it was sort of, there was a lot of uncertainty about not really L LGFA, but any corporate being able to issue any debt, including banks being able to issue sort of longer term debt. So um, it really is there uh, in the case of uh, absolute emergencies. And that would give us uh, enough money to keep financing the sector maybe for a year until such time as we could work through. Well, hopefully markets would recover or we'd look at other options with the government in terms of securing additional uh, financing. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Peter, I can barely see your hand there, mate. Oh. oh, hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah, you don't really want to see me anyway, Phil. Okay. Uh, hi, Andrew. Thanks for coming. Uh, just uh, one real question, or it might be a set of questions, and that is the process to become a member hmm. of LGFA. Uh, I know one of them is actually having to consult, do a special consultative process, which is usually done as part of the annual, either the annual plan or long-term plan. But can you tell me about the what else is needed and what sort of fee would be involved in joining? Okay, the yeah, the, the trickiest part is the sort of consultation. So you there's a few options. You can do it as part of the annual plan, the long term plan, or you can do special uh, consultation. So depending how urgent the requirement to borrow is, is generally it's easier to fit it into existing uh, things such as the annual plan that uh, you are doing. Um, we can help you with the consultation document. So in terms of uh, what other councils have sort of done recently, so we can sort of give you a template that you can use to sort of assist you with that process. Um, you, the reason you have to consult is because when you borrow, you're subscribing for LGFA uh, borrow notes. Um, um, so yeah, every time you issue, you have to put in 1.6% in borrow notes. So there are things that LGFA could, in theory, convert into equity. It's never has, but the reason is because it could be converted into equity, you could end up with a share and a CCO. So it's the, the reason is not about who you borrow from or whether you're a guarantor. It is the fact that you could... Uh, legally end up being the owner of a CCO. So that's the reason you, you have to uh, consult. Um, the other things is you need to appoint a trustee. So again, that's uh, uh, reasonably straightforward and can be done quickly. Um, you need to probably update or just check your treasury policy is consistent with joining LGFA. Um, and you need to complete the legal process. So the legal process is probably a cost of ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So that's paid to your lawyers. LGFA pays. Uh, we use Russell McVeigh as our lawyers, and we pay all our own legal costs. There's no fees that you need to pay to LGFA either upfront or on an ongoing basis. So once you've joined then there's no on, any ongoing costs other than uh, your annual trustee fees, which will be uh, quite small. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Any other? Yeah, David again. Turn your microphone on. With the trustee, Andrew, is that... Uh, who is that? Is that um, an existing councillor or, or somebody outside? 
The professional trustee companies, so ah. probably there's covenant trustees, uh, ah. trustees and executors are probably the main ones. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, yeah, we don't do, deal directly with the trustees, so that is something that the councils uh, appoint themselves. Um, so Philip probably could share his experiences with, with a few of the councils that he's done in terms of uh, um, the costs and who you, who you might use. Okay. Any other questions of Andrew? Wow, well, that's just Andrew, just you mentioned the 1.6 um, borrower notes. I thought that was being proposed to be increased. Is that right? That's, that's right. So I put a resolution to shareholders to increase that to 2.5%. Um, so there's two forms of equity that LGFA has. So it's the paid up capital and it's the borrower notes. So the borrower notes is just a technical way that every time a council borrows, we can get some additional equity. So as the size of our loan book increases, the value of our uh, or the amount of our equity is also sort of increasing. So you each, so for every million that a council borrows, you invest sixteen thousand, and that will increase to twenty five thousand uh, dollars. Um, so we pay you interest on that, and when your loan matures, we repay you the borrower notes. So there's no great cost in actually you subscribing for the borrower notes. Uh, but technically, the, the rating agencies allow those borrower notes to be treated as equity. Um, the reason we're proposing that they increase is because of what's going on globally in terms of financial institutions' uh, amount of equity that they are going to be required to hold. So we've seen in New Zealand, the Reserve Bank has reviewed the amount of uh, equity that banks are going to have to hold, and that's uh, being deferred slightly, but over the next seven years, they're going to have to sit, hold significantly more uh, equity. Um, LGFA is not regulated by the Reserve Bank, but from a credit rating agencies and also investors' um, uh, confidence and willing to buy LGFA bonds, we want to ensure that the level of equity that we have on our balance sheet is similar to what uh, uh, one, one of the major banks um, would be holding. So um, what we're aiming for is to have our equity at uh, the target is 3% of our total loan book. So if our loan book is, say, $10 billion, it's just a little bit more than that, then we're going to have to hold around $300 million of, uh, of equity. Okay. Are there any other questions? I think the biggest challenge for the council is whether they're going to be a guaranteeing or non-guaranteeing um, council. And just that you've got a good slide. I think you, you, you skipped over it, but I think it's actually worthwhile going back. I think it's about slide 15. It's council financial uh, distress, LGFA impact. And I think it's quite quite important that the council actually understand what mitigation LGFA have actually got, um, you know, what the, well, actually go back to the previous slide. I mean, what in terms of if a council was to fail, um, and there hasn't been one in New Zealand since um, the 1930s where there was a Tasma, a, a um, Thames Borough, I think <laughs> that failed, right? Um, probably bet, probably invested too much in gold mines or something. Anyway, so just go through the the distress um, process, because I think that's quite important. I think that's something that certainly the two smaller councils that I've been involved in um, really um, struggled to actually understand the full impact and what the risks were for council. Yes, so we've seen a number of councils that have joined as non-guarantors, and then once they've been a member for a few years, they sort of a whole, quite comfortable with the whole issue around becoming a guarantor. Um, so it means they then have to sign another legal document. So you do potentially incur additional legal costs when you sort of go through that. So it probably costs about another $10,000 to go back through the lawyers mm -hmm. and sort of get that um, done. Um, 
So the um, I sort of touched on that, you know, even if a council did default, it just becomes a timing issue for LGFA in terms of recovering uh, uh, money that uh, would be uh, owed. Um, the protections, I think, are one, the financial covenants. So the financial covenants sort of limit how much any council uh, can uh, borrow. And they're set at sort of reasonably sort of conservative uh, levels. So for example, Kuiper back in 2012, their debt would have been outside the limits allowed by LGFA. Um, but still they didn't default. They did have to get commissioners and appointed and that situation was sort of managed uh, uh, very well. And um, uh, subsequently they did have now become a member of LGFA and have actually their finances are in, in quite good shape. Um, so the, the covenants do stop a council sort of borrowing uh, too much. I think there's also very good supervision of the sector from both DIA and OAG. Uh, so again, probably compared to the 1930s, the level of supervision by uh, the government and the uh, OAG um, is pretty good, as well as uh, LGFA. Um, so we do our own credit analysis on each council. So we are providing reports to the board on the councils that have uh, less headroom left under their covenants and therefore probably would be deemed to sort of be uh, greater risk. Um, we also ensure that councils don't put out uh, long-term plans or annual plans that are forecasting a breach of a covenant. So if a council was forecasting it was gonna breach, LGFA would be very unlikely to lend them uh, any uh, more money. Um, the, and the other protections, I suppose, is the capital that we do have on our sort of balance sheet. So I mentioned that we currently have um, uh, around 265 million of equity that we sort of could use. So other than a particularly large council, uh, we would be in a position to manage any write-offs of a loan uh, if uh, in, the likely, in the unlikelihood that that occurred. Uh, if that did occur, then uh, we had significant equity before we had to make a call under the uh, guarantee uh, to get more. Okay, thank you for that, Andrew. Do people understand that process? I think it's really, really important. Yeah, I should just add, we have, we've actually, I've got there, we've got 650 million of liquid assets. Mm. We've actually got over a billion dollars uh, as we stand at the moment. So we've raised a bit more. So even before we go to the government's billion dollars, you know, we've still got, you know, a billion dollars that if we're not repaid, um, that, you know, we can use that money to to manage through the non-repayment until such time as that we're able to to get that money back from the council. You know, you know, and uh, I, the the example I use is the biggest risk for accounts for this council. If you were a guarantor, Auckland would actually have to become almost non-inhabitable and the government would actually refuse to bail it out. So that's the sort of the level of event that would actually happen. There'd have to be a fundamental failure of the council and its rateable assets. Because if, you know, when you actually um, have a debenture, if you default on your loan, then the, the trustee appoints a debenture, whole, the debenture commissioner and that being a commissioner, that commissioner has the ability to set a targeted rate to recover the outstanding debt. So that's why it becomes a timing issue for LGFA. And obviously people know if you don't pay any rates, um, then the council or the commissioner can actually go in and sell property. Mm. So that would be the normal. So there'd have to be a failure of a council and then of a district before there was a default on a loan. But it's um, an elected member's decision. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Andrew. You can, um, has, just before you sign off, I, I, I know uh, you, you mentioned um, 
Napier hasn't joined yet. I understand they're in the process. Is that correct? Oh, if they called you in. <laughs> oh, well, it's my other job, didn't you know? Yeah. Oh, no, no. Okay. okay. No, that, that's right. They're in the, they're in the process. Of, they're of, in the process. And, yeah. And we've got, I think, about another three in the South Island now that are uh, in the process of joining. So, don't know about the Chatham Islands, but I would suspect we're pretty much in the next sort of year or two, we'll have all the councils in New Zealand. It's just um, sometimes you need someone at the council to make the first step in, in starting to do the consultation. So, Yeah, I think the Chathams are a little bit um, problematic in terms of their covenants, in terms of their, their, rate, their rate income. They'd need a government guarantee. Yeah. Well, they already depend on the government for a large source of their revenue. Yeah, yeah. So we did actually speak to DIA about it, and I think the board said that they could join, but we sort of, yeah, they're particularly unusual in terms of uh, the government um, contribution to their revenue. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any other, any other questions? All right. Th thank you again, Andrew. Um, thank you. And we might see you around somewhere, somewhere else shortly. You yeah, never know. Any follow up questions? Just send emails through, and we will get straight back to you. Uh, yeah, I can, I I can um, enforce. Um, Andrew has been very helpful in um, a number of the councils that I've been involved in in terms of joining LGFA. So, thank you, Andrew. Okay, thanks, Philip. Thanks. Um, what we might do now is. Um, just while we're on the agenda, um, if I can bring it up. If we go to items, I think item six, uh, we've got the annual plan there, but I think it's um, <clears throat> talking about the next steps um, in terms of joining LGFA. And if we can have some sort of discussion about um, where the elected members feel, you know, how do you feel about joining LGFA? And I think the bigger question is, should the council be a guarantee, a guarantor or not? So we've got our item six, Peter. Just for your reference. This is on page 36 and 37. <laughs> So through you, Mr. Chair, are you looking for um, an endorsement from the Audit and Risk Committee to Council? Um, I think it would be useful. I don't know what the other committee members think. I think we've had this presentation. I think it would be useful if we came up with our own, own view. Considering, I, mean, I think managing debt is actually and joining LGFA does come with its risks, and I think it's appropriate that we we don't have to actually agree today. But just since we've had Andrew here, um, while it's fresh in everyone's mind, we may have a bit of a discussion about it. I think it's a. a are you happy with that, Russell? I think I think um, from my point of view, as sorry, Chair, it's as long as it's a discussion because I think staff need to write a report to council yep. that yep. outlines all those risks, the pros yep. and the cons. So. Yep. I'm yep. not sure there's enough information here for council for you know the um, elected members to be making a decision. But no. quite happy with some discussion. Okay. Well, I, th I think it'd be useful to say is where do people you know what's people's views right and what and also that might actually then help you, um, Mr. Chief Executive, write your paper about addressing some of those issues that are that have been raised. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So, Chair, are you asking for some some discussion now? Are you? Is that yeah, what absolutely. Asking? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So, what, yeah. you know. So, I, I, I'm going to start something off anyway because I think um, the big the big question is: do we do we actually need to borrow some money uh, in the near future to to do some okay. of the big items? That's the big one, uh, and and I think that's um, once we've had our full report on our three waters, for instance. I think, without a doubt, the answer to that is going to be a, a resounding yes uh, if we want to do it earlier rather than later. And um, looking at uh, at the report that came from from uh, um, the government finance, 
I don't think that there's there's too much um, doubt in my mind that, that that is the better case rather than going to the banks today. Um, and uh, so I think that's basically where we where we are at this point in time. Okay. I'm, I'm willing to listen to what the rest have got to say. Okay. However, uh, whether we want to be a guarantor or not, I I I sort of have my doubts at this point in time. I don't think we need to really go and wrap ourselves into that. We're only small. We want to get into the job. Uh, we've, it's 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 the fact that we want to be able to secure some money uh, for our for our long term um, uh, financing of, of our perhaps our three waters. What I do need to um, get the sound in my mind is for how long. That's the big one to me. So okay. leave it over to you, Chair. All right, thank you. I think that's useful for um, the chief executive and Mr. Christopher's just help. You know, when that paper comes back to council to identify sure. those issues. Yep. Any other comments, questions? Yeah, David. I, oh, um, with uh, with respect, I totally agree with what Malcolm said, and um, I would have. Um, uh, some reservation about the guarantor aspect at this stage. I don't think it's necessary at this stage. We've always got the option later on. What appeals to me about the whole idea is it's intergenerational borrowing, uh, longer term, better deal than we get from the bank. Um, we can look at the example of um, nearly every other council has, has joined and um, I can only see a potential uh, upside. Um, we are going to be facing major expenditure, as um, Malcolm's referred to, in, in the waters and infrastructure generally. So, um, yep, in principle, um, I, I'm all for the, uh, the process of joining. Okay. So, can I... Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, just, yep. just one thing that I... I to, to add to what I was saying before, um, just to be a member of this, uh, the, the, the upside of that is is that um, there's always going to be a rainy day. And at present, um, we're going <laughs> through some times. And that's the whole country and the whole world, in fact. So I think it is um, quite prudent to, to be able to be in a position to, if we need to, to borrow, whether it be for, for, uh, um, quickly or whatever, it's already there. So even to be a member, is, I think, is an advantage. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Car Carolyn. Yeah, I'll speak in, um, in support. Um, we have to be proactive and we might as well get on the bandwagon now. But um, yeah, interesting presentation and learnt a lot. Um, sounds like a very experienced man, Andrew. Um, and also the 13 year term interests me. Um, still with the, with the one off cost mm. up front, it's, it's not something huge to get into, but I think the benefits are huge. Um, the interest rate is highly attractive. Um, not sure if they do personal loans. Um, <laughs> no, unfortunately, um, they don't. <laughs> I could do with one at the moment. Yeah, seriously, I think we should add that into the paper, Russell. Okay, <coughs> everybody on here and all those viewing by the sounds of the I, money that they're um, holding. I asked for a conflict of interest consideration <laughs> earlier in the agenda. <laughs> oh, don't know how to spell that anymore after COVID. So um, we're not guaranteeing your twenty million dollar loan, sorry, Councillor okay. Iron. So um, yeah, I'll I'll throw it over to uh, okay. Councillor Ranga who wants to. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, uh, Councillor Aaron. Question. Uh, afternoon. Through the chair, fully supportive of what I've been listening to uh, by Andrew, uh, and what he mentioned about we need a total failure of of, of infrastructure mm. for something to absolutely go wrong for us. Uh, really listening to the 13 years and how long this is for. Uh, that interests me. The other point is to be a guarantor, not to be a guarantor. I truly believe that maybe let's just join the club. Let's get in the, get in the door, uh, have a look, see what's going on, and then we can make a decision further on down the line. Uh, those are my thoughts currently. And okay. just, yeah, thanks for the, the opportunity. Thank okay. uh, you. Just, just to clarify that current maximum loan period, that's what their bond period is at the moment. And Andrew said, no, that was because they took out um, every, I can't remember, every so often they'll go to the market and say, we want to issue some debt on behalf of local government. And then they will go and ask for 
people to put in prices and debt and, and length. And um, they'll often specify what period they want. And Andrew said they'll, they'll be doing another one and they'll be looking for about a 2000, 2037. And they'll just keep pushing those out further and further. But that doesn't mean council can't borrow for that period, a greater period or a shorter period. Okay. If I can, please, Chair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to say in regards to Councillor Ian's comment, there is no conflict. I'm genuinely interested. Uh, <laughs> but definitely support um, membership exploration. Would appreciate the report back from our staff to further investigate the risks, the potential risks we have heard uh, from our friend, and I just can't see his... Name He's disappeared. And He's disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Um, from Andrew. our GFA, from Andrew, yep. hearing, reading, and listening, and having the time to comprehend some of that stuff does it's it does take a little bit of time mm -hmm. and understanding, uh, but definitely interested in all options for our community um, to be able to not just look at expenditure but actual investment and long term investment in infrastructure. You seem to have frozen on us. Right. Any other comments? Right. So let's just go back. I think we'll just, we don't need to actually, there's no resolution, I think. So we can just go back to um, our agenda now. We go back to um, item two, pages one to four. Um, confirmation of our minutes held in February, which seems an awful long time ago. Can I have a mover for the confirmation of those minutes, please? So moved, Chair. Thank you. So that was the Mayor and um, Councillor Sparks. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. Right. Next item is um, our occupation, well, our um, occupation, so health and safety measure systems, Paul. Welcome to the meeting, Paul. Thank you for sitting quietly listening to boring um, loan stuff. Welcome. You just quick highlights on, on your report, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, hello, everyone. So the report is um, from January through to April. The five hazards remain the same there's been no change there the focus really um, has been COVID-19 for uh, our council and the health and safety health and safety carried on as normal but with the addition of uh, COVID-19 we identified it as a risk back in January and started to put together our risk assessment there um, this also meant that we had to review our pandemic planning and our business continuity planning, and uh, um, we had to initiate crisis management team meetings. Civil defence was um, likely to be activated. We, we had no doubts around that. So the IMT meetings started in preparation for the um, declaration and the in preparation for the EOC uh, to be activated. Um, we had to identify our most at risk staff. Um, in the first instance um, and uh, get those relocated, so isolated away out of the work environment. So we followed the government guidelines on that and uh, we managed to get people um, relocated. The uh, technology, um, luckily the, the foresight of our um, IT department, replacing our old PCs as they came to the end of their lives with uh, laptop computers uh, helped uh, ensuring our staff were mobile and also we had Zoom uh, quite a little while before the COVID event so we just had to expand that so people could work safely from home. Um, we had to ensure also that we our staff could operate safely with the uh, three waters and the waste, solid waste and, uh, and manage our animal and noise control. So there was a lot of talk around um, our managers ensuring our, our frontline staff were working safely and that we could maintain the services for our community. Um, the Emergency Operations Centre is pretty much scaled right back at the moment. Um, 
a lot of staff have been involved in uh, that, that function and it was um, quite fast paced um, at certain times there as we were going through the higher levels. Um, I guess the other things, um, we opened the transfer station, everywhere else was locked down. Um, we opened the transfer station back up at level three, um, and operating under the relevant guidelines. Um, health and safety priorities during this time, we have to sort of change those. One of my priorities has always been to try and get our hazard register up to 100%. Um, but uh, we had to refocus, obviously. And one of the things we had to really look at was the mental health of our staff. Mm. So the mental health of our staff could be affected by them working in isolation. Uh, they're not used to that. And also uh, working with technology that they might not have had a huge amount of training on and that can be a stressor in its own right um, when we're getting used to using these things um, so we had to maintain good communications with our staff and we still are and so that was mentioned at uh, all the meetings and uh, lots of emails backwards and forwards to make sure that our people leaders and our team team members were staying in contact to try and combat that the other challenge for us was to um, ensure that people's home workstations were as good as possible. Yeah. So that was the biggest challenge. Um, we still don't know how good they really are. And I suspect there's some quite interesting home workstations. Uh, so we, um, we communicated again with staff uh, of what good looks like with workstations. And when I do the workstation assessments here at Council, I normally add some training in there as well so that they can adapt if they need to. So the, the only way we've been able to manage that is to say take more frequent breaks away from the workstation because we doubt it's probably ideal and call out if there's um, any pain or discomfort and that's what we can do. Um, so we've supported staff as usual with our employee assistance program. That's, that's been reminded to them. And uh, regarding the mental health side of things, we. Uh, our HR department um, sent out a remote working and wellbeing survey to see where we've done well and where we need to improve. And uh, we should get some results through in, in this month uh, to review. Um, the the, the COVID-19 has impacted on what we normally do. Health and safety has carried on as normal, as I said, but uh, it has impacted on things like um, getting some of our policies finalised, um, some of our training has had to stop well actually most of our training stopped um, and being rescheduled now and we're also looking at virtual training for the future the health and safety committee meeting uh, we we failed to achieve that one uh, during april uh, we we're extremely busy there but we have one scheduled in for may and since this report i can say that that meeting did take place um, the hazard register work has slowed during this time uh, the contractor um, audits has also um, slowed down and currently not on target so we'll be looking to get that back up to speed. Um, Council uses Vault for its health and safety software. We're currently using Vault 2. We plan to move to Vault 3 and it, the planning coincided exactly with COVID-19 so we have to shelve that and we're looking to do that later in May. Um, just reflecting the situation um, during April, we only had one event recorded, and that's probably a first that I can recall. Um, so one one accident. Um, so that sort of gives you an idea of how quiet it was out there when we normally get um, events coming in from the pools and the parks and reserves. And we did have to do one notification to WorkSafe in February, where uh, a team member was injured requiring hospital treatment and mm. admission for an overnight observation. Uh, I can since report that worker is now back in um, and uh, returning to normal duties and the team have had a review of that incident and um, they've put some improvements in place to prevent that happening again. On the uh, lag indicators you will see um, some days off on the bar chart there um, has, has gone up and that is due to that um, event. I think Mr Chair that probably an outline of the status of the um, occupational health and safety at the moment. Thank you Paul. Any questions for Paul on um, his report? 
Councillor David. Microphone. Yeah. Can't hear you, David. David, your microphone's still off. If I can help you, Councillor Spark. Yep, okay. better. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yep. You have to start um, again now. Yeah. Um, Paul, my question is on uh, page 13, the, the uh, Netball Pavilion. I appreciate the, um, the asbestos um, report is still uh, ongoing and the insurance company are doing their thing. But um, is there any possibility of putting a timetable on, on when this is expected to be completed? Because every time I walk past, I, um, I, I still smell the smoke and... Uh, I think a lot of local residents are naturally concerned as to um, what's going on there. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor David. Yes, um, we we probably could get a timetable together for that. Um, I spoke with our engineering officer this morning, just as a bit of a follow up, and um, the asbestos removal is planned to take place um, in the very near future. The, the, the survey has been done, so. It, there is asbestos there that's confirmed and the next stage is is to get the removal done um, and then I think uh, from what he tells me they need to there needs to be a decision on what exactly is going to happen with with the netball pavilion um, I can I can ask our engineering people for a, a timetable yes okay yes thank you any other questions councillor David uh, no Right. Oh, I'll take Councillor Ion and then the Mayor. Um, just thanks for the report, Paul. Just page 15 with regards to that um, incident. Um, thank you for, um, well, probably not thank you for reporting it, but thank you for reporting it. And it's good to hear that the worker is back at work. But it says here in the report another ute reversed um, into him. Was that a, another work vehicle, KDC, or a community member? It's not uh, through, clear. Yep, through you, Mr. Chair. Yep, thank you, thank you, Councillor Ryan. Um, it was a, a member of the community. Okay, thank you. Mayor Campbell. Ah, uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, Paul, just going back to the uh, what Councillor Sparks brought up about uh, the the Nepal Pavilion. I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in all fairness to, to all parties, uh, we have been shut down for six weeks. So, um, but I think it's because of the fact that it's right in the, in the, the, the front door of our, of our town. It's the most important. We need to get it shifted. And uh, um, I know there was some discussion a little while ago, or just after it happened, as whether there would be anything that could be salvageable. I think... Um, I think a bulldozer is the only way to salvage it and, and start a game, to be honest. You know, there's, there are no brick and, uh, brick, brick and um, or hollow stone block walls and that, but um, yeah, I, I have my doubts about it, to be honest. I was there the night of the fire, so I think we need to be pretty proactive and get the thing shifted. Uh, we've probably been quite lucky that uh, there hasn't been a lot of youngsters and that around the last six weeks or so, but you know, it's only a matter of time and somebody's going to go in there and possibly get hurt. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, w I wonder if, if I could for a moment. Um, um, I, I wonder, could we um, ask Paul to um, speak to the engineering officer and get a report together on the situation as he's talked about, and then we'll provide that uh, to two councillors and um, perhaps in a, in a briefing forum, we can um, discuss options uh, in, in conjunction with um, the engineering officer, if that would be okay. Totally agree with that approach. Thank you, Chris. Away you go, yeah. So, 
For you, Chair Jones, I'm um, just on page 10, please. Yeah. And the policies table, I just note the outstanding item right there at the bottom uh, with a September 19 timeframe. Just looking to see that we are going to pick that up uh, as we get back mm -hmm. into work. Um, and not started, I just noted that comment um, there. No, that's all. Thank you, Chair. Okay. All right. Th thank you for that. I, I missed that. Yeah, not that it hadn't been started. Maybe that policy has been um, retired already before we've even started. Um, just one question, and you might just help me here. In terms of page 15, we seem to be seeing, uh, where are we now? I suppose your average, of, um, previously item seven, we we're averaging 18 events per month and well, 15 to 18 for the first um, three years and then 2020, we've been only averaging five. Do you want to comment on that? Is that, I would have expected they would rate hopefully stay constant, but would be moving to an increased level of um, near misses. Doesn't seem to be happening yet. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Averaging for five uh, events per month um, dropped down because of the, of the low figures for April um, of only one. Ah. So that really skewed our um, figures, unfortunately. Or fortunately that we didn't have an event, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Any other comments on the report? Therefore, can I have a mover for the recommendation um, that we receive this report? Thank you, Councillor Iron. Seconder? No. Got th three. Do we, did you pick, pick one? Or do I need to pick one? Uh, Councillor Sparks, I think he was by a whisker. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you. All those in favour, please say aye. As against, carried. Next item, Treasury report, Mr. Christophers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a, just a little bit more of an expanded report that went to the uh, Regulatory and Services Committee earlier in the week. Um, at the bottom of page 25, you can see the listed, uh, the general funds mm. and also the special funds. Now, the thing to be aware of with that amount of $5 million, it's not actual funds that we have in the bank. So the general funds were fairly close to what they were in the previous year. There is a deficit. And that deficit has arisen because of previous years spending on storm damage and asbestos removal. Those have been the major expenditures during that year. Uh, depreciation funds, they're $2 million less than they were this time last year. The principal reason for that is we have spent $2.275 million on residential developments. However, we do expect to get those funds back. There's just going to be a bit of a delay before we get them back. Right. Going over the page. At this stage, I'm projecting there's going to be sufficient cash to go through to the end of the year. So we won't need to borrow for the immediate future. But there are a couple of unknowns there. Uh, next week will be the last week of the fourth installment rates. So we don't as yet know what impact the lockdown has had on our rates payment. The next table shows the funds that were invested at the 30th of April. And the total funds held is 3.136 million. And when you add the total internal loans of one, nearly 1 1.9, we have total investments of just over 5 million. Now the bottom table on that page is the one I believe Councillor Iron was asking about the interest rates being recorded. This is where we usually put this table. 
and you can see there the investments that we are holding as at the 30th of April. The average interest rates are around about 1.9. And the reason that they're reasonably high compared to what anyone that's tried to make an investment in the last couple of days is that we've had some fairly long-term investments or long deposit times. So that average will be coming down, particularly as the Reserve Bank has indicated a negative interest rate. I guess, are there any questions? Any questions? Don't, oh, Mayor Campbell. Chair, um, through you, uh, Peter, I just would like, please, because this is going out to the public, this, um, this screening, and you mentioned delays with the um, with the building uh, or the the um, uh, the um, home, housing development. Yep. I think it's important, please, that you uh, there's more than just an explanation of we expect to to uh, to do all. the whole reason is the fact that there's been some frustrating delays. Um, and then, of course, six weeks of shutdown, no building to be actually taken part. But there are people sitting there right now uh, in a very, fairly um, anxious time waiting to start their buildings, in the, in particularly in the Bowen Street Centre. And, of course, now um, that the builders are back uh, in, in the Park Drive uh, residential area, um, that's going together like Lego. So I think it's important that just to say there's some delays and uh, and without any any explanation is, is possibly not the right thing for the public to be hearing right now because there are a lot of people there that are, there's some experts of course, um, but there's some people that will tend to write a whole lot of things into, into that sort of a comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Any other comments? Yeah, mate, through the chair. Yeah, sure. I just want to ask a question on page 26, paragraph two. The statement says, however, this is based on the assumption that we will receive 75% of rates installments. Peter, can you give us a more clearer assessment? I know that the rates are due next week as to what kind of return or how many of our people out there are uh, in a good position to pay rates or have currently paid their rates? Please. That, that, that terminology uh, assumption, I always gets my, not too keen on that word. Yeah. Um, the only reason I use that is we currently are not aware of what people's circumstances are. However, I can say we haven't had very many people contact us and ask for an extension to pay their fourth installment. Um, we do have had a few people ring up and say, look, when the office is open, I'll come in and pay my rates. They didn't want to use the other facilities like online banking or giving us their credit card or even depositing a check. So we're picking that we'll have quite a number of people in on Monday when the office is open. Um, like I said, I don't have any indication about whether we're going to get significantly less rates or not at this stage. Okay, thanks, Peter. Uh, really, it's just a matter of sit and wait till next week and see what yep. comes of it. Very much so. Thank you. Watch the space. Right. Any other questions? Any other questions of Peter? Right. In that case. Um, can I have a mover for the recommendation that we yeah. receive the Treasury report? Thank you, Aaron. Seconded. I'll second it. Oh, Councillor Sparks again. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Right, annual plan and performance. Mr Christopher's again. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, this is very much the summary mm -hmm. of Council's performance for the nine months to the 31st of March. 
Um, both expenditure and revenue are pretty much on track. Um, our, cap capital, our capital spend is, as usual for this time of year, the bulk of that happens in the last quarter of the year. However, given that we've had lockdown for nearly two months, it's likely that our capital spend is going to be significantly less than budget. Consequently, we're likely to get less in the areas of subsidies and grants for capital spends. I'll put in there the expenditure and revenue graphs. And you can see from the expenditure graph, there's a table, there's a bar chart over to the right hand side that says where our capital spend is to date. Our financial position is reasonably good. And our cash flow is showing a reduction of $1.6 million to the 31st of March. And again, uh, a big part of the reduction is due to the expenditure that we've done on the re those residential developments. Finally, um, for the non-financial performance targets, which is on page 32. Um, and in, if you have a look in the appendix to the report, which is page 34 and 35, you will see while our satisfaction scores have been reasonably good, there were a number of misses in terms of whether we achieved the targets. Now that's only been one or two percent that we've missed by. And it's, I believe there's going to be a fuller report to the council meeting on the 26th concerning the NRV survey results. So I think if there's any questions, oh, just the other thing is for the council meeting on the 26th, there will be uh, a comprehensive report on the activity performances, financial and non-financial, to the 31st of March. Sorry, any questions of Peter? Yep, just yep. Uh, through the chair, page 30, Peter, down the bottom, 2.2 statement of financial position. Um, I didn't understand that statement there. The, the financial position does not include all receivables and payables as at 31st of December 2019. Um, is that not meant to be 31st of March? It's supposed um, to be the 31st of March. Thank you. But all known figures have been included. So, yeah, help. Could you clarify that, please? Was it a test? No. Chocolate fish? Absolutely chocolate fish. Virtual yeah. chocolate fish awarded. Yeah. I, uh, I owe you a chocolate fish for leaving 31st of December in there. So apologies for that. It's supposed to be 31st of March. Now, regarding the, the accruals of, yeah. and that's the receivables and payables, um, usually at the end of the year, you have your general ledger open and all the creditors put their invoices in. Some are not that flash, so it might be a, a month or a month and a half before their invoices for June are come in. So what hasn't happened here that you, you generally will happen at the end of the year is that I haven't been able to capture all the creditors or all the receivables that you normally would for a year-end report. And you've got to remember the budget that I'll put in there for the 30th of June is estimated on what those full receivables and payables there. So it was just to say, hey, there is a variance between those budgets, between the budgets and the actuals that I've got in there. And part of the reason is I haven't been able to capture all those costs. Okay, any other questions? Was that, did you have a question, Malcolm, or are you just waving at me? All right, any other questions? 
Um, just a question probably to, to Russell. I mean, I think the, the, the lack, uh, and this is going to be problematic through the whole country, have we assumed there's been going to be discussions with our good friends NZTA about carrying over the subsidised works that we haven't been able to um, complete because of COVID? Yeah, so there, there will be discussions. Um, Hanu may be able to explain a bit more, but I mean, this this will be all around the place and we don't even know when, you know, we're, as we're coming out of, well, we're in level two, what the availability of contract is, and that's going to be over the next few months because everyone's going to be trying to get stuff done. Hanu, did you have anything to add? Yeah, it is quite um, interesting that um, right now contractors are in desperate trouble and trying to find work wherever they can. And um, some we are worried that some of our biggest supplying contractors might drop off. So we made quite an effort to try to get them to work as fast as we can. Um, moments we had uh, dropped to a level that allowed them to do so. This might change um, in a couple of months when more work becomes available and, and the bigger uh, industry starts getting in again. So we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll try to do things as efficiently and effectively as possible um, going forward. We will be quite behind with our, pro our project schedule though. And a lot of work will roll over into next year, which um, makes next year very congested. Um, and this might have an impact on contractors as well and possibly the costs involved just a clarification, next year's um, next financial year? Yes, yeah. uh, July yeah. onwards. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any further discussion on the financial? So to me, there is, what, what you're saying is there is some risk contract or risk about availability of contractors. That's what you're actually saying? Yes, so... Um, we were trying to, to, to give all of them work and they've been actually quite good at helping each other as well. Um, so, so, so right now we've got a couple of cheap tenders in because everybody's trying to find work, but it could be more expensive um, in nine months, 18 months from now. Um, so it's something we, we're a bit concerned about that it could be an increase in cost from what we expect and plan for. So we try to get as much of these current um, jobs out now while we have more certainty of the cost going forward. Okay. Chip. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Where you go, Malcolm? Yeah, um, yeah and just um, uh, in discussion of what uh, Hunter was uh, talking about there, I mean, we spoke to a fairly major contractor the other day and they were very, very thankful that they had just finished up a, a fairly large job for regional council and actually uh, were in a, in a pretty sticky position that they actually had no more work on their books at all. And so they started work for us on, on um, uh, Wednesday, um, which is, is, is good news. The good part about it, I think, uh, if we can show some loyalty to our, some of our contractors, mm. hopefully that, that this will have an ongoing effect later on because that's pretty important that we do keep these people around. Um, it would be an absolute disaster to lose them in the future. Uh, if, if they if they fold and and, and disappear off the off the map, so that's it's pretty important that uh, we keep them going. Um, Mr. Chief Executive, I've been working with one council who are in a similar position. Um, they're actually trying to bring forward work that is already on their books that will actually keep. The contractors in the area to give them some security. A, is the council looking at anything like that? I think that's, you know, it's about committing, you know, bringing potentially work forward, not necessarily forward by the time you do it, but some things you've got planned for next year that they're actually starting to um, write the contract documents, do the design, etc. So once is um, the contractor becomes available, they can actually then give that work, put that contracts out to the market is that something you're looking at uh, part of that stuff was what was looked at to get to look at the shovel ready project so there's been a lot of work done around that area yeah but i've you know this, but i'm looking at even just some smaller works or something that's if, people, if there is contractors looking for work doesn't necessarily yep. have to be large projects yeah
Should I say something? Absolutely, Hanu. We can yes. hear. <laughs> <laughs> For you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, we, we are actually working as fast as we can to get these contracts out. We've got significant amount of work. Uh, well, for us, probably not for the region, but for us, hundreds of thousands of dollars of work yep. needs to be done in the next financial year. So um, we are going absolutely flat out um, during this lockdown period, trying to get as much of these um, designs done and getting um, uh, the, these contracts in place so that we can roll them as fast as we can. So we are really going as fast as we can. Not, I don't think we can really accelerate the process much. Okay. With, people we've got, but we are already doing that uh, to the extent possible. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Any other further comments, discussion, questions? Therefore, I'll um, put the um, recommendation that we receive the annual report, annual plan performance summary for the nine months, um, 31st of March be received. Can I have a mover? I'll move it. Oh. Farleen, thank you. Oh, you have a seconder? Oh, oh thank you. Um, Mia Kararau. All right, that's all I see on screen at the moment. All right, all those in favour, please say aye. Those against, carried. Right, item six, <coughs> um, annual plan timetable and proposal to borrow funds through LGFA. Mr Christophers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've had a bit of discussion on this already. Yep. Uh, look, my understanding would be that council is in favour of consulting on the proposal to join LGFA. And as long as I prepare that to go in conjunction with our consultation on the annual plan. I've also got a timetable attached for the adoption of the annual plan and setting of rates. And this was moving it out by a month from what was initially planned. And uh, we've had some discussion on it. Um, the only thing would be that come the council meeting on the 26th, that we will have to have in place a consultation document for the council to consider. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that preparing that consultation document by next Tuesday going to be a challenge or is it all in hand? If, look, we've already got the template ready. It's just a matter of uh, finalising a few of the details and information in there. Okay. So what you're telling us, you're, you're a month late, but um, I am yet to see a council who is planning on adopting as per their original schedule. So I don't think there'll be too much in the way of consequences. When, just a question, when do you normally send your first instalment out, Peter? Um, usually that's posted out by the end of July. Right, so you've got to wait 14, like so, but when's the first instalment date? Uh, the due date's on the 21st of August. So you'll just make your 14 days? Days, yeah. Be very okay. tight. Very tight. Our yep. backstop will be the 25%. Yep. Great. I'm sucking air on that one. <laughs> right? Because right? that actually makes... It, that's, it's an interesting formula and I'm not sure whether Datacom can handle it. Have you checked whether Datacom can handle that process? No, that's one of the, one of the tasks I'll need to do. Yeah, I'd look closely at the 25% process. It's not generally straightforward. Anyway, I have looked at it. For, it's sometimes it's worth putting the penalty date out of, another week rather than trying to use the 25%. Right. Um, so can I have a mover for that recommendation, please? Oh, sorry, can I just ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah, page 37, Peter, um, just under the plan number item 11, letters to special interest groups. Um, will comms be sending that by any method faster than the standard 
letter of the olden <laughs> days because we just I don't think we really get the response that we need to get um, so we need to, to land on the computer or on the something um, so we get real feedback constructive feedback from our interest groups most important well, I, I would hope we will have a contact person with an email address that we will be able to send that out to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a, are you happy to move? Happy to move. Happy happy to move. move. Thank you. Since we got you on the speaker, do I have a seconder? I'll second it. All those, oh, Councillor Sparks. Any further discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. Right. Risk register. 38 to 49. Peter, I assume that's you Thank again. You. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this, just as a reminder for those that are on the committee previously, this is our high level risk register. Um, it's been developed probably over the last three years. We've been adding improvements. Uh, audit have looked at it and made some recommendations. It's pretty much as the committee last reviewed it and accepted it. But I think it's now time to have a look at it again to see if any further improvements needed and whether you believe any other, other risks should be identified. The last set of risks that were added to it related to those that were identified in our audit report, and that's in relation to the service request dates that could be amended and secondly the fact that we can delete general ledger journals and also the lack of segregation when raising electronic purchase orders. The council had made a decision that it was prepared to accept those risks but we felt it was important to include them on the risk register as recognised risks. Okay, um, just a suggestion here if I may Peter in terms of improvement what I have seen other councils do where they change a risk um, in the commentary they use a different font color whether it's red or orange or something that stands out so you can say okay we've changed it from this or use um, word strike out or something similar so someone reading it can actually quickly identify um, what has changed from what was previously reported is quite useful um, any other comments? No comments on our risks? Right, no comments. Therefore, um, can I have a mover that we receive the risk register summary? I'll move it. Seconder. Do I have a seconder? Oh, thank you, Mayor Campbell. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. As against, carried. Right. Risk management, review of risk management strategy. <clears throat> Probably a more comprehensive paper, Peter. Do you want to just take us through the key issues here, please? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a large part of what our risk management strategy is, it essentially lays down the policy for council when dealing with or accepting risk. Now the main principle for our risk policy is getting it as low as reasonably practical. I mean any uh, organisation can attempt to totally remove risk, although that you can't really do that, or get it as low as possible, but there is an associated cost with that. So that's for that reason it's important that we recognize to mitigate risk, there is a cost. So you need to get it down to as low as reasonably possible. 
So what we've got here with our risk management strategy is a seven step process to assist with the management of risk. And so we've got listed there our strategy. Now it is the strategy that was reported to the last Audit and Risk Committee, probably two years ago. It incorporates a lot of the assumptions that we have in our risk register and also our risk framework. Now, I haven't included the risk framework on this agenda, but I intend to do that for the next meeting of the, risk, of the Audit and Risk Committee. I think really is if there's any questions or you identified any weaknesses in the strategy that's before you. Thank you. Ken, I've got one. Um, well, actually, I've got two. On page 50, 54, yep. I've got that nice little coloured table. Um, just Can you just talk about... I, I understand it's, an, it's basically a, a, um, a five by... Five five by five, so you yep. multiply one one row by another row to come up with a, a, a risk total. What worries me is we have an extreme event that is un, unlikely only gets a low scoring. I would automatically think because it's an extreme event, it should actually be automatically considerable. And I know that's the trouble with the five by five. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, uh, look, it's, it's always a matter of, um, of, of your assessment, what, whether you include that as uh, considerable or you say it as low. Um, look, I'm just as happy for that to be considerable. Um, we matched, I matched this chart up with the one that we've got in, with, our, uh, with our risk register. Mm. So it's, it's been that score for a little while, but if, you, if the committee feels it should actually be considerable, happy to change that to considerable. Any other thoughts from the committee? Should it be low or should it be considerable? Considerable? Hand Oh, you want to yeah, say something? I'd, oh, yeah. I'd like to speak to that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Agree with Go that. for it. But while we're talking about considerable or anything else, just can I back the bus up a bit? In the background item number two on page 50, it yes. says council has a risk management framework and established a risk register in brackets, which identifies the high level risks. We talk about all levels of risk. So... Oh, do you want to go? Yeah, okay. Can, Peter, can, can you we, explain can that? Be, yeah, can we be um, more open about that? A low risk is a risk. I, I think. So, commentary, thank you. And for our, obviously, for our um, people who, well, they might not have this paper available in front of them, but um, we talk about all types of risk at any level. Yeah. I, I think through you, Chair, it's not high or low risk when I'm talking about the high level risks. Mm. Um, yeah. There's a considerable number of risks and everything mm. that we do involves risks. Um, in the office here, we've got some risk with chairs just scattered around that I might walk into, but you don't want to see that in your risk register for the high level risks. That's what I meant by the high level risks. They're not high risks, they're high level risks. <laughs> Does that make a bit of sense? Yep. Now we do. We do also have other registers that recognise risks, and Vault has a lot of these things in it, which is all incorporates our risks and where incidents occur, and things that we need to improve to reduce the likelihood of those incidents, and those are risks, and essentially recording those risks too. However, our high-level risk register is the really the upper-level stuff. 
it's more what can I just exp what I interpret that it's it's your strategic risks. That's correct. <laughs> so we're not talking about your the risk of the petty cash not balancing. I mean that is a risk. So we don't talk about that in, in our risk register that's reported to council. But it, it's probably on Peter's mind, um, not between two and three in the morning, but some stage during his working working week. Um, can I just just follow on from that? I think it's what we've got in um, point six, reporting of risks. And I think maybe this is something that needs to be brought back. Often a number of risk strategy slash policies have the process for when the d different actions should be undertaken when we have a, a risk, right? For example, if you have an extreme risk, you know, with a score of 17 to 25, that X, Y, and Z will happen with that. You know, who's identified, who, who it gets reported to, and if you actually, during a period, you identify a new risk, that is now extreme how that is actually reported um, through the system and up and ultimately up into council. I think that would be useful to actually have something um, brought back, maybe I'm not sure when, to the, maybe the next committee about how risks are actually managed um, and reported within that section. I think just we just need a bit more information on that as to who's got responsible for what degree of risk. I think that would help everyone in terms of the understanding of accountability for risk. So through you, through you, Mr. Chairman, to, as I understand it, you want a little bit more elaboration on that reporting of risks and who's responsible and yep. what happens. Yep. And yep. Yep, what happens. Yeah. So if, 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 a, if, if, if we've got a current high risk suddenly goes to extreme, what is the process? And if you've got a medium risk going from medium to high or from low to medium, and who's responsible for actually managing that degree? Okay. Okay, that would be useful. Yep, and I'll bring that back to the next uh, committee meeting. meeting of yep. the committee and also the risk management framework. That would be brilliant. Thank you. Any other discussions on this? Therefore, can I... Um, now, we're, my understanding is we, the committee, are endorsing the risk management strategy with amendments for council for adoption. Is that still valid, or how, is that that recommendation? So your preference to come back to the committee first. Um, I would like to see that table before we recommend it to council. I think that's because that uh, that will then identify the role of. Um, council in terms of receiving the risk, and I think it's a, um, be nice to have that discussion. M members' comments? Silence agree agreement, all right. So I'm happy to move that we receive the report and um, we note um, your proposed actions. I'll move that over seconder. Thank you, Carolyn. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye, those against, carried. Right, last item, procurement policy. All read it and all agree? Everyone happy? It's Friday afternoon, it's Poets Day. <laughs> Um, I think I, I would like to see one more. I do like um, on page, the last page of the agenda, I do like that little flow, flow chart. I think that's really useful. Um, one of the things that always worries me a little bit is, and it's in the, it's in the policy, which is good, it's been um, referred to, is when you believe that um, there are times that it's not appropriate to follow that process. I think the I always like to see a one-up acknowledgement. 
So for example, if you've got delegated authority to make a decision and you think we don't need to go through the tender process, Peter, yep. that you actually then need authority from Russell to actually do that and it's documented. That to me, I think is, is an appropriate, so if one of your staff, Hanu want, doesn't want to go, you know, has got the delegated authority not to go out for tender, so to issue it, to, to spend some money, but they don't want to go through this process, that they actually then refer that process up to you for sign off. I think it's actually a good um, discipline to have. Mayor Campbell. Yes, Chair. Um, I tend to agree with that because I'll tell you what, we have had just a situation just lately um, regards having to put out some tenders for uh, some fencing around Pirate Drive. And it was quite cumbersome waiting because there was not a lot of people there that were actually tendering, mainly yep. because the big players are in Tauranga and, 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 and the likes. And sometimes you've got to make a call to get the yep. job done and we have to go, we have to go local. But you know, and for obvious reasons, the frustration has gone on because of the yep. six week shutdown. But I think it's important that we're not held up. Uh, if, if there's not enough tenders come in, we need to make a call on that fairly, fairly yep. smartly so we can get the job done. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, this is a process where, yeah, it's, it's not a, there's not, this is where you actually identify that, for example, um, and I'm gonna, go to page 65 and use the example here, that council has appointed Holland Beckett Louise as preferred legal services, right? However, council will use other providers when obtaining specialist advice. So who makes that decision and how that decision is actually made? So, um, and I'll use a real live example. So council's gonna need some legal advice in terms of joining LGFA in terms of the debenture trustee. Um, to me, there's a couple of players in the market um it's probably going to ex there is well there are, um there's probably only two people right so does you know say it was going to cost you know um over twenty five thousand dollars so who should actually make that process that we're only going to put out for two people not the three is required and should you know how is that documented that's the bit that is missing from the policy in my opinion we just need some further clarification over that so through you, Chair, current practice is that they would be referred to me and I would sign them off. Yep. Um, so we can include that into the process. I am very happy with that if that's the process. I, I, I fully endorse that and I, I think that should actually be documented. The, the question I'm going to be a bit, bit provocative is, so where the Chief Executive needs to make a decision, he decides not to go out for tender, how do you then manage that, Mr Chief Executive? Can you repeat that, sorry? So you've got the delegated authority to do it, right? You're yep. the only one, right? But you identify that it's, um, for whatever reason, it's not appropriate to go out for tender. Yeah. How do you then, do you sign that off yourself or should that actually be referred to council? I don't want to have to go to a report to council, but I think there needs to be protection for you as well. Yeah, I, th I think one of the requirements of the policy could be that if I do that, I need to report it to the next council meeting. Yep, okay, happy with that? Are members happy with that? Yep, everyone, thumbs up. Thank you, all right, I'm happy with that. Thank you. Happy with that, if I can please, through, yes, through the absolutely. chair, just on page 64, as part of policy statement, um, it's about the sixth point down. I just wonder if that's saying the same thing. So it reads, the chief exec is delegated to approve without going public tender. Um, we, I just wondered if it captured that because that came to mind around uh, procurement outside of policy. It does state the process that's undertaken. Yeah, so that, that's what we would do, yeah. I just wondered if that captures it. I did read that as we were going through. Yeah, I actually wonder whether actually we could actually improve on that because to me that's over five thousand dollars. I think that might be a little, little low. I would actually like to see a more streamlined approach that you know, for example, it actually comes up. Um, I'm not, you know, with a small organisation, it's probably not a problem, um, but I don't see the need necessarily if it's recommended, for example, 
that Mr. Jensen needs to, to do it, that it's a, and he's got delegated authority to spend that money, and that Mr. George approves it, that it actually even needs to come to council because you've actually got another person involved making that decision, unless council wants to see everything. Any comments? Or are you just happy the way it is? Uh, through the chair, no, happy for that, to, if that could be uh, worded to capture. Yep, worded what's to been be commented captured. On. Yep, thank you. Um, and maybe in alignment to the uh, flow chart that is on page yep. 66, it has some ceiling, top ceiling yep. levels in line with that chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the, my only other comment I have in terms of this process, and I have had to review a tender process that where there was a late tender and I'm always nervous where I see that late tenders will, will not be accepted except in exceptional circumstances but we actually haven't got and this is where the disagreement um, became what is an exceptional circumstance um, the fact that the person um, the traffic was heavier than normal going into the offices and therefore he missed the tender close off. The officer didn't agree that that was exceptional, but the person submitting the tender thought it was. I have actually seen procurement policies where basically saying is late tenders will not be acceptable full stop. Any comments on that? Either Hanu or Russell? The problem, the problem is that, especially in, in our region, where we have a very small number of tenderers and contractors who would tender for some of these projects, yep. sometimes these guys get in trouble and they cannot meet some of these dates. Um, and if you tell them, sorry, you have no chance, you end up with insufficient number of tenders and it will cost you a lot of money. So yep. you, you want you want to have some freedom under certain conditions to say, listen, there are extenuating circumstances here where we can allow a specific tender at another week, you know, and then we will note that in the process that they are an advantage of another week, you know, and it will be some some, some penalty for that. But it's very hard to say no. You shall not be late. Um, ah. you, you would you would lose in an area we're in. You would lose yep. important tender potentially. Oh. So, so 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 the way I would overcome that problem right, is basically say, look, if you get, if the tender comes to say, look, I can't comply with that time to be in the tender, that you then give a notice to everybody. The tender's extended for another week to ev to everybody. Um, to accommodate that. Otherwise, the, the problem you have is it's, you're not actually describing what those exceptional circumstances are. If you even had an example of what an exceptional circumstance is would actually help the, the process. But what is exceptional to me may not be exceptional to you. And that's the problem we've got. Aaron, Aaron did you want to say something? Yeah, through the chair. Just uh, totally uh, like the point of having some form of documentation for an exceptional circumstance after the fact, after five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. But we also got to think about if you give one, one company the right to put it in after five o'clock <coughs> and word gets out that they had it in by another competing company, then you open yourself up for a whole can yep. of worms. And uh, <clears throat> you'll have a whole lot of companies saying, well, if it's happening this way, how's this outfit running? Yeah. I yeah, just want to I, see that. Um, I'm nervous about that. Russell, did you want to say something? I, I just wanted to um, say that it's really hard to define all of the exceptional circumstances you're oh, going to have. So no. if you have some examples, that yep. doesn't help people all the time. I think what it really boils down to is that the person that's got the late one and hasn't had any advantage in terms of knowing what other tenders have put in or anything like that. So I think if we work around that risk that, it's still, um, they are not getting an advantage 
solely from the fact of being late that they hear what the other tenders were or anything like that. Yeah. That removes all of that risk. For example, we just did it for the COVIDs, but we told everyone they're getting an extra two weeks. Yep. It wasn't like only for you know, everyone got it. Yeah. One guy still put it in in time, but they yep. were not very cheap. But it was their decision, you know? Yep. Um, although you could argue they worked very hard to make the first deadline and others were now advanced, I don't know. But we, we did tell everyone. It will be very difficult not to tell everyone that you yeah. advantage someone by giving them more time. Yeah, the, lock, the lockdown in this instance was an exceptional circumstance. Oh. Yeah, uh, no, no one would argue with that. But the example that I used was a legitimate one that a tenderer thought they was, was going to take them 15 minutes to get into the council offices, but because of heavy traffic, it took them 25. And the tender closed at 12 o'clock and they turned up at um, 12.05 and the tender was not accepted. And they argued that heavy traffic was an exceptional circumstance. That's the problem you've got, right? Yeah, I agree that COVID-19, heck, it's, everyone's calling it a black swan event, which is, makes it a very exceptional circumstances, right? I think, to me, what you could actually change the wording to is unforeseen circumstances. Happy to do that? Whether the committee are happy with that, that's just another way of doing it. Aaron's got a thumbs up. Carolyn, thumbs up. Forex, thumbs up. David, thumbs up. Yep. All right. Everyone's thumbs up on that. I, I do also just want to say that, for example, we want to build a specific structure that meets subcontractors. Yep. And the engineer who, did, who, who created the tender, me in this case, mis, or, mis, uh, or underestimated the time it takes for subcontractors to actually go and do the design and cost them. Yep. That should not be part of that. If I then say, well, I gave you guys four weeks and actually this is a six weeks job, I can blanketly give everyone two more weeks without oh. having to go through that process. Oh. Is that right? Oh. Absolutely. See, to me, that's not a late tender, right? Yeah. What you're doing yeah. is you're actually in that process, you're telling everybody you're changing the tender, you're giving a notice to all tenderers that it's not closing at four o'clock this Friday, it's now going to close at four o'clock on in two weeks time. And everybody knows that. I've got no problem with that. That to me is, is normal good practice. All right, any further discussion on this? So I'm, do I have, well, I think, um, we actually received the report, right? And note the um, the and um, note the amendments, and I'm happy to move that. Noting the amendments, do I have a seconder? Thank you, Darlene. Any further discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Right, those against, carried. Um, that concludes the business, and I declare the meeting closed. Thank you very much for your participation and your tolerance of me trying to chair a meeting through Zoom. It's something I haven't, I've done a little bit of, but it's challenging sometimes. All right, thank you all. You've done well, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, You've all brother. done well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.